Hi everybody, Dave the Rave, Roving the Rock here and today um, I'm going to read to you a science fiction short story originally published in 1966 and written by Bob Shaw It's called Light of Other Days It's all about something called slow glass which of course none of us are familiar with but hopefully the meaning will become clear as the story unfolds um, the story has been adapted here for telling about the Isle of Arran. OK, here goes. Leaving the village behind, we followed the heady sweeps of the road up into a land of slow glass. I had never seen one of the farms before and at first found them slightly eerie, an effect heightened by imagination and circumstance. The car's turbine was pulling smoothly and quietly in the damp air, so that we seemed to be carried over the convolutions of the road in a kind of supernatural silence. On our right, the mountain sifted down into an incredibly perfect valley of timeless pine, and everywhere stood the great frames of slow glass drinking light. An occasional flash of afternoon sunlight on their wind bracing created an illusion of movement, but in fact the frames were deserted. The rows of windows had been standing on the hillside for years, staring into the valley, and men only cleaned them in the middle of the night when their human presence would not matter to the thirsty glass. They were fascinating. But Pamela and I didn't mention the windows. I think we hated each other so much we both were reluctant to sully anything new by drawing it into the nexus of our emotions. The holiday, I had begun to realise, was a stupid idea in the first place. I had thought it would cure everything, but of course it didn't stop Pamela being pregnant, and worse still, it didn't even stop her being angry about being pregnant. Rationalising our dismay over her condition, we had circulated the usual statements to the effect that we would have liked having children, but later on at the proper time. Well, as pregnancy had cost us her well-paid job, and with it the new house we had been negotiating, which was far beyond the reach of my income from poetry. But the real source of our annoyance was that we were face to face with the realisation that people who say they want children later always mean they want children never. Our nerves were thrumming with the knowledge that we, who had thought ourselves so unique, had fallen into the same biological trap as every other mindless rutting creature which ever existed. The road took us round the south end of the island until we began to catch glimpses of Kintyre far ahead. I had just cut our speed to absorb the view better when I noticed a sign spiked to a gatepost at the bottom of a wee track. It said, Slow glass, quality high, prices low, J. Robertson. On an impulse I stopped the car on the verge, wincing slightly as tough grasses whipped noisily at the bodywork. Why have we stopped? Pamela's neat, bright blonde head turned in surprise. Look at the sign. Let's go up and see where this is. The stuff might be reasonably priced out there. Pamela's voice was pitched high with scorn as she refused. But I was too taken with my idea to listen. I had an illogical conviction that doing something extravagant and crazy would set us right again. Come on, I said. The exercise might do us some good. We've been driving too long anyway. She shrugged in a way that hurt me and got out of the car. We walked up a path made of irregular packed clay steps nosed with short lengths of sapling. The path curved through trees, which clothed the edge of the hill and at its end we found a low farmhouse. Beyond the little stone building, 
Tall frames of slow glass gazed out towards the voice stilling side of the hill's ponderous descent towards the waters of the Kilbranan Sound. Most of the panes were perfectly transparent, but a few were dark, like panels of polished ebony. As we approached the house, through a neat cobbled yard, a tall middle-aged man in ash-coloured tweeds arose and waved to us. He had been sitting on the low rubble wall which bounded the yard, smoking a pipe and staring towards the house. At the front window of the cottage, a young woman in a tangerine dress stood with a small boy in her arms. But she turned disinterestedly and moved out of sight as we drew near. Mr Robertson, I guessed. Correct, I uh, coming to see some glass, have you? Well, you've come to the right place. He had one of those calmly dismayed faces one finds on elderly road menders and philosophers. Yes, I said. We're on holiday. We saw your sign. Pamela, who usually has a natural fluency with strangers, said nothing. She was looking towards the now empty window with what I thought was a slightly puzzled expression. Uh, over from Glasgow, are you? Well, as I said, you've come to the right place and at the right time too. My wife and I don't see many people this early in the season. <laughs> well, does that mean we might be able to buy a little glass without mortgaging our home? I laughed. Oh, look at that now, Robertson said, smiling helplessly. I've thrown away any advantage I might have had in this transaction. Uh, Morag, that's my wife. She says I'll never learn. Still, let's sit down and, and talk it over. He pointed at the rubble wall, then glanced doubtfully at Pamela's immaculate blue skirt. I'll wait till I fetch a rug from the house. Robertson limped quickly into the cottage, closing the door behind him. Isn't such a marvellous idea to come up here, I whispered to Pamela. But you might at least be pleasant to the man. I think I can smell a bargain. Some hope, she said with deliberate coarseness. Surely even you must have noticed that ancient dress his wife is wearing. He won't give much away to strangers. W was that his wife? Of course it was his wife. Well, well surprised. Anyway, try to be civil to him. I don't want to be embarrassed. Pamela snorted, but she smiled whitely when Robertson reappeared and I relaxed a little. It's strange how a man can love a woman and yet at the same time pray for her to fall under a train. <laughs> Robertson spread a tartan blanket on the wall and we sat down feeling slightly self-conscious at having been translated from our city-oriented lives into a rural tableau. On the distant slate of the waters below, beyond the watchful frames of slow glass, the Waverley paddle steamer drew a slow white line towards the south. The boisterous mountain air seemed almost to invade our lungs, giving us more oxygen than we required. Some of the glass farmers around here, Robertson began, give strangers such as yourselves a sales talk about how beautiful the autumn is in this part of the west of Scotland. Or it might be the spring or the winter. I don't do that. Any fool knows a place which doesn't look right in summer never looks right. What do you say? I nodded compliantly. I want you just to take a good look out towards Kintyre, Mr... Connolly. Connolly. That's what you're buying if you buy my grass. And it never looks better than it does at the minute. The glass is in perfect phase. None of it is less than ten years thick. A four foot window will cost you two hundred pounds. Two hundred? Pamela was shocked. That's as much as they charge at the Sindo shop in Buchanan Street. Robertson smiled patiently, then looked closely at me to see if I knew enough about slow glass 
to appreciate what he had been saying. His price had been much higher than I had hoped, but ten years thick? You don't understand, darling, I said, already determined to buy. This glass will last ten years and it's in phase. Doesn't that only mean it keeps time? Robertson smiled at her again, realising he had no further necessity to bother with me. You say, pardon me, Mrs. Connolly, but you don't seem to appreciate the miracle, the, the genuine honest to goodness miracle of engineering precision needed to produce a piece of glass in phase. When I say the glass is ten years thick, it means it takes light ten years to pass through it. In effect, each one of these panes is ten light years thick. More than twice the distance to the nearest star, so a variation in actual thickness of only a millionth of an inch would... He stopped talking for a moment and sat quietly looking towards the house. Turned my head from the view of the Cobranon sound and saw the young woman standing at the window again. Robertson's eyes were filled with a kind of greedy reverence which made me feel uncomfortable and at the same time convinced me Pamela had been wrong. In my experience, husbands never looked at wives that way, at least not at their own. The girl remained in view for a few seconds, dressed glowing warmly, then moved back into the room. Suddenly I received a distinct though inexplicable impression she was blind. My feeling was that Pamela and I were perhaps blundering through an emotional interplay as violent as our own. Um, I'm sorry, Robertson continued. I thought Morag was going to call me for, for something. Now, where was I, Mrs Connolly? Ten light years compressed into a quarter of an inch means... I ceased to listen. Partly because I was already sold. Partly because I had heard the story of slow glass many times before and had never yet understood the principles involved. An acquaintance with scientific training had once tried to be helpful by telling me to visualise a pane of slow glass as a hologram which did not need coherent light from a laser for the reconstitution of its visual information and in which every photon of ordinary light passed through a spiral tunnel coiled outside the radius of capture of each atom in the glass. <laughs> this gem of, to me, incomprehensibility not only told me nothing at all, it convinced me once again that a mind should concern itself less with causes than effects. The important effect, in the eyes of the average individual, was that light takes a long time to pass through a sheet of slow glass was always jet black because nothing had yet come through but one could stand the glass beside say a woodland loch until the scene emerged perhaps a year later. The cheap glass one found in places like the Vistaplex and Panorama stores usually consisted of a quarter of an inch of ordinary glass faced with a veneer of slow glass perhaps only 10 or 12 months thick. If the glass was then removed and installed in a dismal city flat, the flat would, for that year, appear to overlook the woodland loch. During the year it wouldn't be merely a very realistic but still picture. The water would ripple in sunlight, silent animals would come to drink, birds would cross the sky, night would follow day, season would follow season, until one day, a year later, the beauty held in the subatomic pipelines would be exhausted and the familiar grey cityscape would reappear. Apart from its stupendous novelty value, the commercial success of slow glass was founded on the fact that having a scene dough was the exact emotional equivalent of owning land. The meanest cave dweller could look out on misty parks and who was to say they weren't his? A man who really owns tailored gardens and estates 
doesn't spend his time proving his ownership by crawling on his ground, feeling, smelling, tasting it. All he receives from that land are light patterns. And we've seen those, those patterns could be taken into coal mines, submarines, prison cells. On several occasions I have tried to write short pieces about the enchanted crystal. But to me, the theme is so ineffably poetic as to be paradoxically beyond the reach of poetry, mine at any rate. Besides, the best songs and verse had already been written with prescient inspiration by men who had died long before slow glass was discovered. I had no hope of equaling, for example, Moore with his In the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, fond memory brings the light of other days around me. It took only a few years for slow glass to develop from a scientific curiosity to a sizeable industry. Much to the astonishment of we poets, those of us who remain convinced that beauty lives though lilies die, the trappings of that industry were no different from those of any other. There were good sindos which cost a lot of money and there were inferior sindos which cost rather less. The thickness, measured in years, was an important factor in the cost, but there was also the question of actual thickness or phase. Even with the most sophisticated engineering techniques available, thickness control was something of a hit and miss affair. A coarse discrepancy could mean that a pane intended to be five years thick might be five and a half, so that light which entered in summer emerged in winter. A fine discrepancy could mean that noon sunshine emerged at midnight. These incompatibilities had their peculiar charm. Many night workers, for example, liked having their own private time zones. But in general, it cost more to buy sindos which kept closely in step with real time. Amala still looked unconvinced when Robertson had finished speaking. She shook her head almost imperceptibly, and I knew he had been using the wrong approach. Quite suddenly, the blonde helmet of her hair was disturbed by a cool gust of wind, and huge clean tumbling drops of rain began to spang round us from an almost cloudless sky. I'll give you a check now, I said abruptly, and saw Pamela's brown eyes triangulate angrily on my face. You can arrange delivery? Aye, uh, delivery's no problem, Robertson said, getting to his feet. But wouldn't you rather take the glass with you? Well, yes, if you don't mind. I was shamed by his readiness to trust my script. I'll unclip a pane for you. Wait here. It won't take long to slip it into the carrying frame. Robertson limped down the slope towards the Syriate windows, through some of which the views towards the Kintyre were sunny, while others were cloudy and a few were pure black. Pamela drew the collar of her blouse close at her throat. The least he could have done was invite us inside. There can't be so many fools passing through that he can afford to neglect them tried to ignore the insult and concentrated on writing the cheque. One of the outside drops broke across my knuckles, splattering the pink paper. All right, I said, let's move in under the eaves till he gets back. You worm, I thought, as I felt the whole thing go completely wrong. I just had to be a fool to marry you, a prize fool, a fool's fool. And now that you've trapped part of me inside you, I'll never, ever, never, ever, never, ever get away. Feeling my stomach clench itself painfully, I ran behind Pamela to the side of the cottage. Beyond the window, the neat living room with its coal fire was empty, but the child's toys were scattered on the floor. Alphabet blocks and a wheelbarrow the exact colour of freshly pared carrots. 
As I stared in, the boy came running from the other room and began kicking the blocks. He didn't notice me. A few moments later, the young woman entered the room and lifted him, laughing easily and wholeheartedly as she swung the boy under her arm. She came to the window as she had done earlier. I smiled self-consciously, but neither she nor the child responded. My forehead prickled icily. Could they both be blind? I sidled away. Pamela gave a little scream and I spun towards her. The rug, she said, is getting soaked. She ran across the yard in the rain, snatched the ready square from the dappling wall and ran back towards the cottage door. Something heaved convulsively in my subconscious. Pamela, I shouted, don't open it too late. She had pushed open the latched wooden door and was standing hand over mouth looking into the cottage. I moved close to her and took the rug from her unresisting fingers. As I was closing the door I let my eyes traverse the cottage's interior. The neat living room in which I had just seen the woman and child was in reality a sickening clutter of shabby furniture, old newspapers, cast off clothing and smeared dishes. It was damp, stinking and utterly deserted. The only object I recognised from my view through the window was the little wheelbarrow, paintless and broken. I latched the door firmly and ordered myself to forget what I had seen. Some men who live alone are good housekeepers, others just don't know how. Pamela's face was white. I don't understand. I don't understand. Slow glass works both ways, I said gently. Light passes out of a house as well as in. You mean? Don't know. It isn't her business. Now, steady up. Robertson's coming back with her glass. The churning in my stomach was beginning to subside. Robertson came into the yard carrying an oblong plastic covered frame. I held the check out to him, but he was staring at Pamela's face. He seemed to know immediately that our uncomprehending fingers had rummaged through his soul. Pamela avoided his gaze. She was old and ill-looking, and her eyes stared determinedly towards the nearing horizon. I'll take the rug from you, Mr Connolly, Robertson finally said. You shouldn't have troubled yourself over it. No trouble. Here's the cheque. Thank you. He was still looking at Pamela with a strange kind of supplication. It's been a pleasure doing business with you. The pleasure was mine, I said, with equal senseless formality. I picked up the heavy frame and guided Pamela towards the path which led to the road. Just as we reached the head of the now slippery steps, Robertson spoke again. Uh, Mr Connolly, I turned unwittingly. It wasn't my fault, he said steadily. A hit and run driver got them both down on the Brodick Road six years ago. The boy was only seven when it happened. I I'm entitled to something. I nodded wordlessly and moved down the path, holding my wife close to me, treasuring the feel of her arms locked around me. At the bend, I looked back through the rain and saw Robertson sitting with squared shoulders on the wall where we had first seen him. He was looking at the house, but I was unable to tell if there was anyone at the window. Dave the Rave, Rove in the Rock. Over and out, done and dusted. Cheers till next time.